He is risen. He is risen okay, some of you weren't paying attention, so now I'm going to do it again because we need to really do this, okay? This is the greatest moment ever. He is risen. He is risen oh, amen. You know what? Forget Presbyterian. We're Pentecostals here now. That's it. That's, that's it. What a great day that we get to come in and do some celebrating. Celebrating because our world has been changed. Celebrating because we know something that the world hasn't figured out yet. There is a king. And he's none of the politicians you can think of. He is Jesus Christ. And there is a kingdom that has come and is coming. And that's the one of our Lord and Savior. And death has been defeated. That is unbelievable. All because our God is that good. Let us take our time today as we celebrate to reflect on the fact that we no longer have to fear death. We no longer have to fear whatever happens in this age because the tomb is empty. Death has been overcome. Let us continue to celebrate with one another this truth. And today, let us sing with all our hearts and reflect and let it live within us, the truth. But guess what, guys? Because his tomb is empty, one day yours will be too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good. We come before you in awe. That through your son, you would carry the cross. That through Jesus Christ, you, the living God, would take all that the evil and idolatry and hatred in this world and say no to it. Oh Lord, you have been so good to all of us and to humanity. And we say thank you. And Lord, we say thank you that you were faithful to your son, that the tomb is empty, that new creation has come forth, that the world has been judged, and a new has been fulfilled and is promised. Father, speak to us by your Holy Spirit, we ask. By your grace, speak to our hearts about what this means, the depth of what it means, Take us deeper so that we may walk out of here a changed people, which is what you want for us. We praise you and we thank you. And Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. Lord, we confess that we don't always live the resurrection life you offer us. That we too often choose to live by the standards of the old age, the one that's been judged. That we continue to worship the things we make and ourselves. That we continue to walk away from you and forget the graciousness you have in changing us. So forgive us when we are deceptive. Forgive us when we live in anger and hatred. Forgive us, Lord, this week when we have not trusted in you but put it into our own understanding. Forgive us when we live for the trinkets of this age like lust and greed. Father, change us today, we pray. You are risen. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ did come and he carried his cross. And because of that, every time we confess our sins, both as individuals and as a community, he is just and faithful to forgive us. And the resurrection says he did it so he can. So we are a forgiven people. Believe it. Believe it in your heart and worship like it's true. Amen. Feel free to stand and sing.
Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say,
double duty this morning. <laughs> um, I just have a few quick announcements. Being Easter, we're just going to run through these quick. Um, first of all, this coming Friday night is our uh, worship night. So you're all um, invited to join on top of kind of the regular contemporary worship. Uh, Bob and Debbie are also going to be sharing a bit more in depth about their trip to Roatan. So you are all welcome to join us for that. And secondly, uh, we've decided we're going to be starting, or maybe I should say restarting, um, men's and ladies breakfasts here um, one Saturday a month so we're going to do the men are going to be starting April 20th so come next week we'll have more of a sign up and more info about it and then just for save the date the ladies is going to be May 11th and we're going to kind of alternate moving forward so we'd love to have all the men and ladies out to those please Look at all these pretty dresses, Christmas, very nice. <laughs> Easter. <laughs> Are you, yeah. Didn't this, somebody tell us one time, Christmas is all year round if you let it. All right, we got, we got one trailer coming up here. Isn't this wonderful? Every time, like, they keep growing. It's wonderful. All right, guys, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these children. We pray that you will breathe the resurrection life on them and that you will give them, wins on their level, the truth about you being the one who's overcome all. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. And gals. Do we have the slide for giving? Yeah, so I, I, I've been asked to just continue to share. There are different ways to give. Now, we know when pre-COVID, like everyone just handed their check into the, to the offering plate, right? Thank you for that, for getting my head there. And it's been so long, I forgot what an offering plate was. But now it's changed, right? And now everybody gives online. And people ask me sometimes how to give. So I want to just point this out. If you're interested in supporting Mountain View Church, if you, this is what you would like to do, we have, first of all, PAR is something where I'm going to give every month at the same amount, and then you don't have to worry about it. It just comes out of your account, okay? Offering plates are in the back. If you're old school, you say, I'm not going to be one of these hip youngsters. I'm going to keep showing them. I'm joking. You can also give online if you want to, especially if you want to do a one-time gift to Mountain View Church. And then if you want to give afterwards, you're just saying, oh, you know, Emery Sermon was so great, I need to give him a tip. Um, I don't get tips. You can use a square, and they'll be, it'll be out there. Now, honestly, the square is useful. It's really useful if you want to give, but also if we have events going on, that'll probably be where you go. And Christina, are you the one that still sits up? Where's Christina? Is you the one up there? Yeah. So Christina will greet you out there. All right? Now, here's the important point. Why do we give? We give because of gratitude. That's biblical giving. 
It is not a law. It's a part of worship. We are invited to come, and it, the craziest thing is, even though he gives us everything, he praises us when everything he's given us, we give some of that back. Like, I always tell the story that I was given a quarter every year from my father, or every week, and I would stick it in this, like, plastic church, and they would praise me for something I just took from dad and put it in there. Well, it's like that, guys. God has given you, and he wants you to give because you feel grateful for who he is and grateful and wanting to see that happen throughout the world. He doesn't want you to give cheerlessly. So we do give, and we want to also pray that the Lord will use this that we give for the building up and glory to him. So let's do that now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all these gifts that you've poured upon us. The, you are the God of the cattle of a thousand hills. I love that saying. You, are, you have everything. And you have poured yourself upon each one of us, given us life and resurrection. And you provide for us. We thank you. We ask you to take these gifts that we have given as acts of worship from cheerful hearts and use it to build up your kingdom to the glory of your Son, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Bow your heart and your soul as we pray, as I lead in prayer. Glorious Savior, we paused yesterday to remember that Saturday was silent. The light of the world had become flesh and had been laid in the darkness and silence of a tomb. But you entered the grave to become its master, to seize the keys of death and Hades. You are the Lord of light who descended into darkness and became the death of death. You are the living word who died to reign as Lord also of the silence. So we no longer have to fear death or silence. Exalted and resurrected Lord Jesus, today we remember and celebrate your triumphant resurrection. You are indeed Savior, Messiah, Anointed One, to be worshipped and praised by all nations and all creation. Let the earth sing, let your people shout, Alleluia, Hallelujah. Because you are alive, Lord Jesus, preaching the gospel is not useless, it's essential. Faith in you is not futile but fertile. We're no longer encased in our sins. We're fully wrapped in your righteousness. Those who have gone to sleep in you are not slumbering in the void. They are savoring your resurrection glory. We are less to be pitied than anybody and more to be grateful than everybody. Because you have been raised from the dead, everything changes, Lord Jesus. You are the first fruits and guarantee of a whole new order, the new creation, dominion of redemption and restoration. The decay in our earthly bodies will give way to the delights of our resurrection bodies. The kingdom of this world has already become and will be fully manifest as the kingdom of our God and of you, Jesus Christ. You are already reigning and you will reign forever and ever. You are working all things together after your will and you are working in all things for your good. All evil dominions, wicked authorities, and malevolent powers have already been defeated by you, 
and one day will be completely eradicated by you. Hallelujah, many times over. Lord Jesus, your death is the death of death, and your resurrection is the resurrection of all things. The wonder, the glory, the grace. In light of this great hope, free us from the pettiness and emptiness of living for ourselves. By your compelling love, propel us into a life of living for your glory, in your story, with your joy. We are free, we are loved, we are yours. Hallelujah. What a savior. Hallelujah, what a salvation. So very, amen, we shout and pray in your most glorious and exalted name. Now hear our congregational out loud prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 10. Sing, O barren one, who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded. For you will not be disgraced, for you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger, for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. The New Testament lesson is from Mark chapter 13, verses 28 through 31. Nope, sorry. Mark, yeah. chapter 16, 1 through 8. That was last week, Emma. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, 
and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Wow. What an honor it is to preach this. I got to tell you, I love this. This is my favorite Sunday. Not Christmas is close, but this one, this one's pretty big. Um, so I was looking for a story for this. Mark's got an unusual post-crucifixion narrative. I want to tell you that. It's different than the other ones. Um, and I'll explain that as well. But he really wants to emphasize something that uh, the others don't. The others give us actual resurrection scenes, people actually meeting Jesus, touching him, you know. But Mark's ends actually in verse 8, that the rest that's added, everyone agrees that that was added later because the ending of Mark, if it was verse 8, doesn't make any sense. And he ends with this story of an empty tomb and a guy telling him to go out and preach it and then they're all afraid and it just ends. But actually it's beautifully written and it's incredibly powerful when understood. So I was thinking about a story and this one hit me and you guys probably have heard this but I'm going to share it again because it's worth sharing. There was a little boy and he had Down syndrome and he was in a Sunday school class and he was quite a bit older because his cognitive age level was not the same as his biological age. So he was with these littler kids. And he was asked by the teacher, she had one job for them on this Easter Sunday to go out with these little, um, you know those eggs he used to open, the little plastic ones, you know what I'm talking about. And to go out and find something that, that reminds them of new life. It was spring, they got out there. And they all come back in about 25, 30 minutes later. And of course, little Betty gets it and she opens and there's a flower. And of course, and they go, oh yeah, and it's like the flower of life or whatever. I don't know what they taught. And then another one even brought in a living ant and it was like, look at this. And they're like, oh wow, yes, a new living being. And the theme was going on and on and on. And finally, they got to Timothy. And Timothy handed his egg in and of course, he, she opens it and there's nothing there. And of course, immediately, these kids, and aren't kids so wonderfully nice all the time, right? They said, oh, you are so stupid, Timothy. You can't even follow a basic instruction. And he was sitting there, and he started to tear up, and the teacher's trying to be nice. said, it's okay, Timothy. Did, did I not make myself clear? And he said, well, you said we should get something about spring that reminds us of Easter, and I did that. And she... Air? And he goes, no, it's empty. The tomb is empty. And there was dead silence. See, Timothy figured something out. That that's the main point. That's the main point of this story. This is the most profound theological moment made by a young man with Down syndrome. In fact, my friends, this is the exact point Mark makes in his gospel account. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your living word. We pray that you will breathe life upon us, that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us to let this speak into our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. So I told you, Mark's gospel is a bit different. 
It is. When you get to the ending of all the Gospels, they're all different because they have very different ways of writing. Okay, They have different literary um, needs to be fulfilled. It isn't, by the way, none of them are written as if they're newspaper accounts. They're all crafted within the whole Gospel that they were writing in. And Marx, we'll get right into it, has the scene, which they all have, of the women coming to anoint the oil, the, the Jesus with the, the oil and the spices. And it was Sabbath past. They wouldn't have been able to do it right then because Sabbath, but it was right after that, so it's right in the morning. And they're coming in, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. That was very normal, that was saying. The fact that they're going by themselves has always been an enigma to me in this story because they couldn't have moved the rock, which they actually kind of... But you know what, when you're grieving, I, I've come to the conclusion, maybe this is just humanity. You know, you grab your stuff, you're going to go do it, and you go halfway there, and you go, uh-oh, who's going to move the rock? Isn't that interesting, though? We can't move the rock. Can we? When you think about it, out of our own good, we can't make this happen. And so they go to anoint him, and very on early, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, finally they get it, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And they looked up, and they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. There was no way these girls were going to, these women were going to be able to roll this back, but it was already rolled back. You can imagine already the fear they must have felt, eh? You can imagine you're walking in, you've got grave robbers, you've got thieves, you're three women going into the middle of a graveyard. There's reality going on here too. And, and you just must be perplexed. What are they doing? Did somebody come before us? And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, the side of power, the side of truth, dressed in a white robe. Now, why white? Well, we know by this time in the first century Second Temple period, based on all their understandings of Ecclesiastes and all kinds of other texts, that you only wore right to, white to celebrate. He's starting off, he's dressed for a party. And that's what he is dressed like, this young man. It's interesting, he, they don't give you the glow-in-the-dark moment with the angel here, do they? He's trying to tell you something different. This young man is sitting there, and he's wearing this white robe, and they were alarmed, do you think? Can you imagine going to see Aunt Jane's grave, and all of a sudden some guy's sitting there in a white suit and says, hey, it's all good. Yeah, okay. And he said to them, do not be alarmed, do not be afraid. That's the actual word. Do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Why does he use the word Jesus of Nazareth? I'm just telling you this because Mark is a brilliant author. The, last, the first time we see this is right at the beginning of Mark's gospel. And who says Jesus of Nazareth? The demonized man. Here we are at the end. And who says Jesus of Nazareth, the angel? This has all been about a spiritual battle, and he's won. Now the one proclaiming him is the one from God. He has risen. He is not here. Now, he had told them this a few times, right? But they kept thinking it's a metaphor. This must have shocked them. See the place where they laid him? But go, and here's the greatest moment in the Gospels, I think, one of the greatest moments. First of all, and I don't believe any of this, and so please don't throw anything at me, but women were not considered able to bear witness in that time. They were not allowed to stand in a court. They were too emotional. I can't believe where they got that from, but anyway. Oh, I'm getting a look. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yet here this man sends women to preach. You see that? To proclaim. If I was writing this book and I was making this up, I 100% wouldn't write this. That's why I know it wasn't made up. Because no one would have taken this seriously, but who is the first person that he sends out? A woman. You think he's trying to change things? 
And then he says, see the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So this is the story. There's a resurrection. She's got told them even where to go meet Jesus. Wow. So what did they do? And this is the part where it's a strange ending for people. And they went out of the tomb. And, and no, they didn't just go out. They booked it out of there. Okay? They fled. And I'm going to tell you, if I just saw somebody buried, and I came back, and he was out of the ground, and some guy's saying, there's just this empty coffin, I'm getting out of Dodge right then. So do not judge these people. Because guess what in the first century they knew? Dead people stayed dead. Just like we do. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they, were, they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What? That's the end? Why would that be the end? Well, we know that that could have been the beginning, but we know they do actually go and tell in the other Gospels, don't they? And the listeners of this would have known the original church that they had done these things. So why leave it there? Well, because Mark's Gospel, and here, for those of you who weren't around when I started this, I have to teach something for a minute to understand why he did it. For those of you who were around, you'll remember what I said. Mark's gospel is all about the new exodus in Isaiah and the day of the Lord in Malachi. He quotes those two texts at the beginning. And when you read an ancient text, the first part of the text gives you the code on how to read it. So when John's gospel says, in the beginning, we know that the code then is the creation story because that's how it starts. He quotes... Isaiah and Malachi. And in Isaiah, there's this promise of a great exodus in Isaiah's time. That God knew they were in exile, but he was going to deliver them. He says, comfort, comfort my people to begin with it. But the problem is, Israel doesn't take him up on it. Why don't they take him up out of this exile? They end up arguing with him because he chooses the wrong deliverer, a pagan king named Cyrus. They refuse him because he doesn't want to do it the right way. Because they're afraid. Tells us again and again, they're afraid. And because they're afraid of what the living God might do with them, they rather choose false gods in their fear. Okay? That's the purpose of Isaiah. The whole teaching of Isaiah and the second exodus is that God wants to deliver us Only we can stop it. Okay? Malachi then goes on and says, I'm going to do this, but you guys better get right, or the day of the Lord will come and be judgment. Well, what have we seen in Mark's gospel? Jesus has been coming along saying there's a new exodus, a new exodus, and people are either afraid, or they do not understand him. So even though the day of the Lord has come, they absolutely refuse him. Okay? It got to the point where the cross is the ultimate moment of this new exodus, an exodus out of sin, out of death, out of evil. And now he's saying, Mark, exactly what Isaiah was saying to his people. The new exodus has come, and Mark's always leading us, leaving us with a choice. That's Mark. Mark leaves you with a choice. So going back to Isaiah, just see how many times it says, fear not, Yahweh says to them, and they fear. Listen to this. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I've chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you who I took from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you. I have not cut you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and perished. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find though those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who says to you, fear not. Fear not is used in this section in more than any other part. I am the one who helps you. You shall seek... Fear not, 
You see this? You worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. And that we end of this moment and they're afraid. Do you see it? All of the challenge of Isaiah was saying this exodus is coming. I am the God who can do this. Fear not. And he's been saying to them again and again, I am it. I am the resurrection. Fear not. And they're afraid. Right? So will they go proclaim? It says they don't go proclaim. That's the other problem. In Isaiah, it says, fear not and proclaim me to the world. In this text here, it says, go on high. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion. Herald of the gospel is what that means. The good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news. Lift up. Fear not. You see the connection? Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Well, they are right there and behold their God. And now the challenge is, are they going to be like Isaiah where they're afraid to share this because they're afraid of who this God is or do they trust this God who's just said, I'm going to deliver you? Well, that's the ending of Mark. Mark ends it with this without a resurrection appearance because he wants us to hear this because it's written for us and say, what are you going to do? Now, thank God they all knew that these women overcame their fear, didn't they? They know these women had the courage, but Mark's saying, here's what can stop it for you, fear. Fear. Fear of not trusting God. So you have this empty tomb and you have this challenge. Will you be afraid? Or will you go out, encourage, and share it? Well, what does it all mean? That's the challenge. By the way, that's beautiful writing. You'd almost think the guy was inspired. That's amazing writing, by the way. And you say, well, Emory, how? We couldn't see that. Well, we're not first century, second temple Jews. They would have seen that. They know how to read this stuff. I'm telling you right now, what does it mean, though, today? Well, the first thing it means is death is no longer it. To quote the great Karl Barth, the goal of human life is not death but resurrection. That's the first thing it means. How many of us are living our lives as if death is the end? How many times are we told to live our lives? You only live once, right? I think Jesus went, not me. We are taught to live as if this world is it. That what you get out of this world is it. But if this is true, this isn't it. That this is just a small microcosm of a whole bunch. That's incredible enough, right? But there's also one other part in this that I can't think is so profound. That the empty tomb is what we all have to face. I think Mark wrote this this way because all the people of his generation who had met the risen Christ were dying. And everyone that was coming to believe had to believe someone came up to him and said there was an empty tomb. Do you see? Just like those women. That faith comes down to believing in a living Christ that's out of a tomb. What did Jesus say when Timothy touched his side? How better for those who believe by faith without seeing? Well, everyone has to do that. So he leaves it with an empty tomb. Do you see that? Karl Barth said, Christians do not believe in the empty tomb, but in the living Christ. Well, he obviously doesn't mean they don't believe in the resurrection. What he means is, our main focus is not a tomb that's empty it's what that means because when you believe there's an empty tomb you have to then admit that God's alive that he's not dead the empty tomb points us to where we're supposed to have faith Jesus Christ people can get this messed up oh I trust in the empty tomb why you need to trust that this God then is not dead do you see So why fear? This is a question. Because we haven't really taken serious what this story means for the world. 
we have made it a children's story. Guy pops down, goes into heaven, nice, oh, he comes out, he's nice, he gives us a hug, gives us a noogie, oh, everything's nice. What this means is the world has been judged. This world as it is with its death has been judged. It means nothing can be the same. Pannenberg, one of the best quotes of all time, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that no one would question it except for two things. First, it's a very unusual event. And listen to the second one. And second, if you believe it happened, you have to change the way you live. Why fear? Because you have to change the way you live. It means living for this world with its codes and its desires and its appetites has been judged. The resurrection means this world is going to get a remake. This world is not it. And that means all of our arrogance and all the things we trust in this world are no longer worthy to be trusted. Well, that should make you a little afraid. It means the things I value may not be good. Why were they afraid? They were afraid, number one, because the tomb was empty. But they also knew what this meant. Everything they knew to be true, death, corruption, has all ended. And this whole new world has come. And now what do you do? If the tomb is empty, folks, then the way this world lives, that with its focus on trying to get out of death, is no longer the ultimate end. That means you've got to reconsider why you live. Do you see? And that's really, really hard for people, especially if they like the way they live. Do you see that? Why afraid? Because if this is true, it means I am the Lord. That means Jesus Christ is king. It means everything has changed. And you've got to take him serious, not yourself. And I don't think we like that. My daughter, God bless her right now, I'm trying to get her to drive, okay? I love my daughter, and I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but, you know, sometimes you have to suffer. And I keep asking her, why aren't you getting your L? And I know deep inside it's because she's afraid of the change. A little bit. A little bit. She's not a big change fan. That's a microcosm of what it means when the resurrection comes. Everything has been changed. It means everything we thought was true. And if you don't think you become afraid when that happens, think in your life when your life's falling apart and everything you had trusted in falls apart. How do you feel? And the problem is, of course, this fear comes because it is such a radical message that people in the world will shame you. The fear is from other people, isn't it? I'm going to tell you right now, please, Christians, hear me out, just so there's no misunderstanding. Becoming a Christian doesn't make you popular in this world. If you're going to be a biblical Christian, okay, you're not going to be picked number one on every team. You will be mocked. You will be ridiculed. I promise you this, Western Christians get so angry if they change a Starbucks cup and don't put the cross on it. We are so lucky. Let me tell you, if you really believe in the resurrection and change your life, you're going to offend people because you won't go after the same things as them. You will be shamed. How do I know? Because they, Jesus told us that's going to happen. Right? Right? And what about Paul in his Gospels? I just have to go to, to Romans. For I'm not ashamed of the Gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why would he say that unless the world wants you to be ashamed? What does he say again in Corinthians? Can't read that. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. You do understand in this world, when you tell somebody Jesus came back from the dead, that is it. they're not just offended because it's a silly story in their mind because dead people stay dead. It's because what you're saying is there's a different king and Lord. And the reason they shame you is because they like to be their own king and Lord. 
Okay? So why fear? Because this world has been changed, and if you're not a little afraid, if you hold on to anything in this world and it's just been told, time's up. You should be a little afraid because this changes everything. I'm telling you right now, if, now I'm going to quote this guy because then I'm going to look like I came up with this and I don't want to do that. Timothy Keller said, Hello. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Because if he did rose from the dead, then what he said is truth. Whether you happen to like it or not. That means, and I know this is brutal in our culture, your proclivities aren't to be worshipped. Your proclivities, and of course, we always go to sexual proclivities in this world. What it means is all our proclivities, all of those things are laid to question because he's the resurrected king. That's what the world's going to be like. I always say to people, you like Jesus, you like God. You don't like Jesus, you're not going to like God. But let me tell you one thing. You should be a little afraid if this isn't who you like. Because he's already won. And everything matters now. Everything in your life. None of the things you think matter as much as this. If this happened. If it didn't, who cares? I agree with Keller. But we know it did. It changes everything, folks. And he wants it to change right now. So, how can you tell what's the fruit of whether you're afraid or not? Whether you're willing to do this. Everyone can say, I have great faith, and shut up and never say anything, and never suffer and live like the world. You can. And you can call yourself a Christian, you can call yourself mainliner, Baptist, Press, Pentecost, I don't care. But this is the litmus test for those ladies. They had to go tell these men, people who weren't allowed to tell anyone anything, a story that made no sense. <laughs> that Jesus Christ is risen. And they had to go and do that for the same reason Israel during Isaiah's time did. Because God is the center part of the story and we're called to share that. And he has done great things. And now the question is, will you proclaim that? Will you share that? And I'm not talking about grabbing someone, you know, with the Bible and... <clears throat> If it, I tried it, it doesn't work. Just gets you arrested. <laughs> it's a joke. But we're called to proclaim this truth because it is the ultimate truth in the world. We who have to believe in the empty tomb by a testimony of another, they from the angel, somebody had to tell us that. None of us have had the resurrection touch. None of us had the resurrection Christ come in our room we have to believe it, don't we? And then the question is whether we believe it is whether we'll go out and share this because this is the most profound thing that's ever happened. And here's the crazy part. I wouldn't have picked us. I'm one of you, and I know how much and how weak we are. But this God's so incredible, he chooses us. Or will we proclaim? It depends how afraid we are. Little, what's his name, Matt, Matthew? Timothy. They had to give him a biblical name and get mixed up. Little Timothy, he had a choice. And he proclaimed. And he got mocked. And he became, to me, an incredible vision of what we're supposed to do. He didn't grab his friends and say, you got to believe this or you're going to hell. He didn't do that. He didn't grab them and say, this is the most common sense thing ever to do. He had no skills. He was no theologian. And yet he did this moment where he opens this egg that's empty. And he says, new life comes out of this. Wow. The most incredible thing is it took a courage of a child like that to teach someone like me. 
A, how simple is this and how important it is. You see, because Timothy died six months later from health complications being a person with his disease. And it was funny because as they say, the church is packed, everyone loved Timothy, he just, you know, typical Down syndrome, just a wonderful, happy person. And it was time then for all of them to do their thing and then they were all welcome to come up and say words. And 12 little grade seven, or sorry, seven-year-old kids came down and each one of them had an egg and they opened it at his coffin. And they made sure everyone saw it is empty and they put it on top. He was not afraid. He impacted and those kids will never forget that and it'll change their life. That's the question Mark wants to leave us today. He is risen, thank God. He has changed the world. Do we like that? Or does it freak us out? And are we willing to go out? Now some of you are saying, Emery, I'm not a theologian. Doesn't seem like you have to be. He picked these young ladies. None of them were theologians. All it seems to say is, tell this story. And all they had to do was, he is risen. He picked these women. Think about this for one second. Without women preachers, we would have no knowledge of the resurrection. Think about that. If that doesn't make you pause, nothing will make you pause that he chose them to be those. If he can choose those people in that time, he can you choose you today, I promise. And the good news is we don't have to be all glitz and glamoury. We don't have to put on a show. He already did. That cross and that empty tomb is the greatest show you'll ever see. Because I tell you the truth, it changes your life now and forever if you believe it. The power of, our, of the gospel is not in our presentation. Only the Holy Spirit has the power to open heart, a heart. Strategies, methods, and presentations are merely tools. We just get to go and share. The incredible news right now is I'm going to tell you, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because that tomb is empty, yours will be too. Live like that's true. And share this empty tomb with whoever you run into, if you believe it. Don't be afraid. Because they might hear you and have their life changed. Like those little children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. You are a gracious God, and you have done the incredible. You take, you take people who shouldn't share in the culture, and you say, yep, you're going to share. You take failures like the disciples, and you make them leaders because of your resurrection. You take those who hate you and because of your resurrection, you made them followers. Lord, you took the world that hated each other, and because of your resurrection, you transformed it and had people worshiping together who never would. Lord, your way is so much greater, and your resurrection shows us that's the way to life. Help us to believe that, and help us, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to begin to live that way as a people of forgiveness, as a people of trust, as a people of hope. And may we, in our own way, when we get the chance, share this incredible truth that the world isn't what they think because there is an empty tomb. And Jesus, the living God, has gone out from there to Galilee and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel free to stand and sing. How 
the ground began to shake the stone was rolled away his perfect love could not be overcome now death where is your sting a resurrected king has rendered you rolled away his reckless love could not be overcome and now death where is your sting our resurrected king has rendered you sitting there praying and singing and just this thought hit me all of us go through tough times right and it can feel like uh he isn't risen at times i want to assure you that he is that the tomb is empty and i want you to hear this why that's important is that he's a living god right here right now if you're just somebody who's walked away for a bit or you just your trust isn't there right now I just want to pray with you right now and see if just ask God to come and bring his living, the living Christ in your life. Let's take a minute. Heavenly Father, for people who are wounded here, who've felt their faith has been challenged, who this world has been working over, I pray that the living Christ would touch you right now. That you would be reminded that there is the resurrection, that nothing, not even the worst, stands up against that. Lord Jesus, by your spirit, breathe upon them. Help them come back. 
people online who might be feeling this way too. We just pray for them. He is alive. He's here right now and he's worth trusting. Give us the courage to share that so people can live. In Jesus' name. Now go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, knowing the tomb is empty and we have a living Christ. Amen.